Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. And you have joined one of the project briefing sessions for the spring 2020 um, CNI uh, virtual meeting, which is scheduled to run till the end of next week. Today, we have a uh, presentation with five speakers um, drawn from quite a range of institutions. And you can see everybody's name and affiliation on the slide here. Um, taking up an important topic, which I will introduce in a moment. After everybody has given their part of the presentation, we will field questions and try and respond to them. Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate that um, Q and A session. Uh, I note the there is a Q and A tool at the bottom of your screen, uh, which you can use to type in questions. And while we'll address all the questions at the end of the presentation, I'd invite you to queue up questions as they occur to you during the um, talk. Uh, there's also a chat box and we'll be sharing a few URLs uh, there. Um, so that, that may also be a useful thing for you. So um, with that, let me just say a couple of words about this topic. And I'm really delighted to have this presentation. Um, as all of you who have been involved in scholarly publishing or indeed digital humanities as well know um, it's been a tremendous ongoing challenge to get people to take advantage of all of the um, all, all of the affordances of the digital environment as part of scholarly communication and a big piece of that has been the persistent concern that their work will vanish after a certain period of time because it will become technically obsolete and unpreservable. And because of that, scholars have been very cautious about straying from things that, you know, are sort of the moral equivalent of print on paper, um, even if it's done digitally. To really address this, we have to figure out how to do it at scale. And that's why I think it's so important that we have university presses who are accustomed to thinking at scale um, and organizations like Clocks and Portico um, who are trusted preservers who think about preservation at scale as a part of this discussion. And uh, I'm really hopeful that out of the kind of work that's reported here, um, we can see the emergence of genuine strategies at scale that will address this problem and make our scholars comfortable that they can use at least some well-defined set of additional affordances of the digital environment. So I'm really interested to hear what our speakers have to say. And with that, I've gone on way long enough and I'll turn it over to David Millman to start the presentation. Thank you all for joining us and a special thanks to our presenters today. Hi, thanks Clifford. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today we'd like to give you a progress report on our project to enhance the preservation of new forms of scholarship. Um, I don't want to introduce it too much more because I think Clifford actually gave a really good summary and um, uh, we're just happy that everybody's able to be here. Uh, the project is organized in three distinct phases and we call them sprints. Today we'd like to report primarily on the first one which we completed earlier this year. Uh, the second sprint is wrapping up now and we'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons from that sprint today too I think. Um, and the third sprint is starting up around now. Um, we're slowed down a little bit by the pandemic, but as we've been largely working with each other remotely already, we, we've been able to continue along pretty well. Um, so today our focus, uh, along with uh, uh, 
Clocks and Portico is on two of our university press publishers, uh, Michigan Publishing and NYU Press. Michigan has developed an online platform called Fulcrum, um, and many of you may have seen presentations about it in C at CNI in years past. Uh, and NYU Press has developed uh, the Open Square platform, and we'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Uh, then we'll review the experiences uh, from Clocks and Portico about how they dealt with these publication platforms. And finally, we'll talk about next steps and our recommendations. Um, so first up is, uh, let me just see if I can advance my slides. First up is Jeremy Morse, uh, Director of Publishing Technology at Michigan Publishing. Uh, Jeremy will hand off to Jonathan Greenberg from NYU. We'll talk about Open Square. Next after Jonathan will be Tib Bouchier Kayan from Stanford, uh, Stanford Libraries, and they run the technology that underlies clocks and locks. Uh, Tib will hand off to Karen Hansen from Portico, and Karen will then turn it back to Jonathan to hear about next steps, and we'll hopefully have time to take some questions. Uh, so Jeremy, over to you. Okay, hi. Hopefully you're seeing my presentation okay. I'm uh, Jeremy Morse, Director of Publishing Technology at Michigan Publishing, a division of University of Michigan Library, and I manage the development of the Fulcrum platform. I'm here to give an overview of the way we present scholarship on our platform and how we're aiming to see it preserved. Okay, we'll start with a brief tour of what we're doing on the platform. So just for an overview, uh, Fulcrum started from the idea that the digital resources that are generated in the course of researching and writing a scholarly monograph should be co-presented along with the finished ebook in a way that supports the scholarly argument. To this end, Fulcrum is first and foremost an ebook platform with a particular emphasis on supporting EPUB 3, but Fulcrum also serves as a repository to make resource files discoverable and downloadable with a growing number of formats viewable on the platform's user interface. And if desired, these resources can, present it, can be presented in the flow of the text. So to look at some examples, here we see the landing page for a book on the ACLS Humanities eBook collection, uh, which is hosted on Fulcrum. Uh, this is volume two of the Aplanta series. And by clicking the read book button or one of the entries in the table of contents, we open the EPUB in our eBook reader. And here you can see in this case, uh, there's a figure that is included in the EPUB file itself. So it's packaged in the EPUB file as you would expect to see in any downloadable ebook. But if we follow the link for the resource, we arrive at the resource's own landing page where we not only see its metadata, but we can view it in more detail in a IIIF viewer. Now, if we go back to this book's landing page, we can select another tab and get an overview of all the resources for this title. Here's an example of another book, Animal Acts, which has a number of video resources hosted on the platform. Rather than include them in the EPUB file, which would bloat its size considerably, uh, and it would also use the default HTML5 uh, video player, which is fine, but what we're doing is embedding them using an iframe embed code, which is generated by the platform and allows the reader to play the video using the third-party application Able Player, which we've integrated in the, into the platform in our e-reader. And that lets readers take advantage of Able Player's features for caption display, speed manipulation, uh, et cetera. The IIIF viewer from our previous example could also be embedded in the same fashion. The author in that case just decided to go with a different kind of presentation. In our most complex title on the platform, A Mid-Republican House from Gabby, a 3D scene encapsulated as a WebGL object is presented side by side with the EPUB so that they can be navigated independently while also taking advantage of cross-linking. So that would be another example of not being packaged in the EPUB, not being embedded in the EPUB, but just being co-presented co on the platform. So what exactly are we trying to preserve of all of this that we're presenting? I should note the goals I'm articulating here are those of Michigan Publishing, and they are in line with those of the University of Michigan Library generally in terms of their preservation strategy but those principles guide the development of the Fulcrum platform and therefore apply to the non-Michigan content that we also host. So our overall strategy 
is focused on preserving what we consider the version of record, those components which can be assembled into the scholarly argument and the description necessary for that assembly to provide a functional work. For example, while we think having the video embedded within the text makes for a better reading experience, a link to where that video is viewable is probably adequate for preservation purposes. So we can shoot high, but we have to think of what our reasonable fallback is. So what's important to us is that you can cite this work today and be confident some future reader can follow that citation and make sense of what they find there. Understand the argument, understand why you cited it, um, see what you basically were seeing when you made that citation. What does that leave out of scope? We're not focused on preserving the fulcrum presentation of the content as you see it today. Navigation, for example, might look very different. So, so there might be formatting changes too. While we're interested in the possibilities of emulation, our investment continues to be in a format migration strategy. And while we strive to present our content in the best manner possible, we recognize that the preserved form while maintaining an essential functionality may be reductive in some way due to cost constraints. In other words, uh, we're satisfied with not locking in the design choices or even the implementation that we've made today, because in general, we think that we're gonna be able to improve them over time anyway. So trying to keep the content fluid to uh, enable that a better, a better future for its presentation. And uh, with those goals in mind, I'll hand it over to Jonathan. I think you're muted, Jonathan. Let's see, Jonathan, can you turn on your microphone? There we go. Perfect. Okay. So I'm, I'm Jonathan Greenberg. Uh, I'm the Digital Scholarly Publishing Specialist, um, and I uh, have uh, I report jointly to NYU Libraries, to the Digital Library uh, Technology wow. Services in NYU Libraries, and to NYU Press. Uh, my role in this project is both as a representative of NYU Press and their um, uh, enhanced um, digital publications. Uh, and uh, as a, a member of the team in, in the digital library department uh, in NYU libraries. Um, today, I'm mostly going to be talking about NYU Press and its, its, um, its Open Square platform, which you can see uh, on this slide. Um, Open Square um, is uh, an in-house platform for open access books. So unlike Fulcrum, uh, Open Square is really just designed as a platform to display books published by um, NYU Press and only NYU Press and to do it in a way that is efficient and uh, can, uh, can, does not take um, um, excessive resources away from the press or from the library. Um, so the, 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 it is, it's sort of a working model for a sustainable library built, built ebook platform for academic books uh, that uses available open source software. So um, we use um, the Redium JS viewer in Open Square and are, uh, uh, have plans to, to uh, implement uh, a next generation of Redium EPUB a viewer in into Open Square when that is is ready. Um, we're currently working with um, uh, some outside uh, um, developers to to help develop that that next generation reader. Um, the other goal of Open Square is to provide a place to for the press to publish enhanced eBooks, um, and that's where this partnership really comes into play uh, between the digital library. Uh, um, which is a department of um, 
software developers, project managers who can really work uh, on developing uh, the technology uh, required for enhanced ebooks, and the press, which has a large and important list in media studies. Uh, many of the, the media studies scholars uh, who work with the press have a keen interest in um, publishing uh, these very new forms of scholarship that this project is, is devoted to. And finally, Open Square was developed as, as a kind of testing ground for research uh, projects, such as the Enhanced Network Monographs uh, project um, and, and for this one. Um, and like Fulcrum, we decided to use uh, EPUB as a standard format. Um, EPUB is already something that is produced in the, in the press's regular workflow. Um, and it's something that most publishers um, already produce. And so if we're to develop a, a kind of uh, efficient platform where uh, the, press, the press can um, deposit open access works directly into this platform, then EPUB is really the, the, the way to go, um, or it was for us. Um, so preservation challenges. Um, and these apply, um, I think, equally to Fulcrum and to Open Square. EPUB is a rich, flexible standard uh, because it's designed to accommodate a range of textual and non-textual features. Um, the EPUBs are basically a, a package of HTML, CSS, SVG, um, but can have all kinds of other things in, included in them. Uh, anything that can go inside that HTML uh, can is can be valid in inside of an EPUB. So it can it can include code. It can include references to remote resources, and so um, developing preservation strategy for EPUB as a whole standard is is a kind of uh, challenging project. Um, however, most scholarly books I would say are, aren't aren't so bad. Um, you know, most most scholarly books. Um, contain uh, a com some combination of text and images that uh, we're used to, to preserving. Um, we need, of course, to get proper metadata and proper processes in order to deposit these works into repositories. Um, but um, the vast majority of scholarly books, um, I'm quite confident that we can develop um, processes to, to, to um, preserve. However, uh, once we start to enhance these ebooks and enhance them in particular ways, uh, the challenges start to appear quite quickly. Um, there are two, the NYU Press has published two books uh, as enhanced ebooks, uh, and both of them make use of remote resources in some way or another. Um, one of the books, uh, by any media necessary, includes embedded YouTube videos that are embedded at various points in the, in the text. Uh, Show Sold Separately included, includes both embedded uh, video, this time hosted uh, on Fulcrum, uh, and embedded uh, images. And these are the, the, the images and video that we, we see uh, on the Fulcrum platform. This, was, this, this book was produced jointly on both platforms as, as part of the development of, of Fulcrum and, and of, of Open Square. Um, so this was, you know, this is something that the authors at NYU Press uh, are asking for, uh, something that we would like to support, but we really didn't know um, how uh, we could efficiently and sustainably um, uh, preserve these, these works. So we were very, very keen to work with Portico and Clocks on this project to develop these, these strategies. And with that, I will hand it over to Tib. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm Tib Dicharkela. I'm the acting uh, program manager of the LOX program. I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. Uh, the LOX program is uh, a 20 year old institution at uh, Stanford University libraries, but we are also the technology partner for the Clocks Archive, uh, who are one of the preservation services represented in this uh, group work. Uh, 
And so uh, before we delve into some of the specifics of this project, just one slide of, of uh, general methodology notes about sort of LOX preservation technology. LOX preservation technology is rooted in web preservation, the preservation of web-based materials and web-native content. Uh, a LOX plugin is how you teach the LOX software, which is sort of a very general framework, how to harvest and process a particular preservation target, for example, an ebook publishing platform or some other form of content. The Clox archive uses two main preservation workflows, one that is more like the traditional Lox methodology of preserving web native content by harvesting it from the publisher's website and uh, sort of a separate workflow where content is transferred directly from a content provider into the archive and stored as is, as source content. So it can be whatever files that the publisher has provided. Developing a LOX plugin to preserve any particular piece of content is an iterative process. Uh, a typical work cycle would be an analysis phase, adding and editing rules and code to the LOX plugin, crawling the target, and then reviewing the results and trying out the replay. And this feeds back into a new analysis, which sort of completes the circle and, and iterative development occurs in this manner. Um, I, I hear Cliff's uh, representation that uh, publishers have been shy about availing themselves of straying too far in the electronic era from the moral equivalent of publishing a hard copy book in that I think that that era has actually sailed, that boat has sailed 20 years ago. Uh, the era of URLs or documents uh, is long gone and uh, even though publishers don't intend to have electronic content that strays too far from the equivalent of publishing a book, the implications of their technology choices and of the web environment have actually strayed from that long ago and have made web native content harder and harder to preserve. So here are uh, just a few uh, common misconceptions about uh, web content, uh, URLs or documents, that's not the case anymore. HTML pages are self-contained. They used to have links to images in JavaScript and CSS, but now these things are themselves dynamic and there is uh, oftentimes no universal way to discover what all URLs the browser will generate and fetch at runtime. Uh, HTML pages are essential content plus personalizations. Nowadays, that's also not so true. Uh, content is rendered onto a canvas of pixels uh, that, that the HTML page is. Uh, from multiple sources. Uh, authors provide the work to the publisher and the publisher provides the work to the reader. That's also not true. Videos, images are now hosted on third party services. Some of the primary research content is now hosted from arbitrary places on the web like YouTube or other places. Even PDFs and EPUBs are no longer static bundles. They're now dynamic. Uh, they're, they're logical bundles, but they're not physical bundles anymore. Uh, fonts are no longer provided by publishers, so uh, they are now from third-party services that can go away or be unavailable at any time. And even images are no longer static resources on the web. So all of these factors contribute to web native content uh, being increasingly difficult to preserve. Uh, these were the six works that we focused on from the Fulcrum platform. So this particular presentation is about experiences with the Fulcrum platform. Here's a screenshot from Animal Axe, as we saw earlier. Here is now another screenshot of what it looks like when re-rendered after having been preserved in a LOX environment. As you can see, some of, the, uh, some of the fonts don't look right. Some of the images are too big. So you can tell that in spite of our best efforts, we could not discover all of the JavaScript and all the CSS that is necessary to render the page correctly. Here's another example from volume one of Aplantis. And here's what it looks like in, uh, in re-render. And obviously, same thing, there are some, uh, some fonts that aren't quite right. Specific examples of things that are hard to uh, preserve uh, with uh, a faithful re-rendition re -rendition at replay, uh, the fonts, uh, some of the colors, right? I mean, this is sort of stuff that's embedded in CSS. Uh, some of the characters are now from uh, sort of dingbat or emoji fonts. And so the characters may not be present at replay. Uh, some of the spacing of the tabs is wrong. Some of the uh, thumbnails are too large. 
if they don't have all the information. Uh, these arrows are pointing to sort of dynamic features. You can sort and filter the content by date and by size, and you can have 20 per page or 40 per page or 100 per page. They all generate different URLs that are, it's the same content, it's the same, uh, it's the same stuff, but it's just re-rendered differently and generates a combinatorially large number of URLs. It's also searchable by you know, keyword and section and various other ways, and that cannot be preserved without having access to a lot more of the underlying platform and then attempting to replay that platform, and that's not, not, not easy to do. Uh, here is another example of something that was uh, difficult, uh, even though the publisher did not intend to make it difficult. This is just a link to a resource page, that particular uh, video clip. As you can see, it's a very standard uh, A link in HTML and has an href to some file, which was obviously discovered and preserved. But it has this little data context href additional tidbit. And JavaScript embedded in the site hijacks normal browser behavior. And when you click on that link, it doesn't go to the target of the link. It first goes to that side link, which I guess is used for tracking, and then delivers you and moves the browser to the target URL. So because this side URL for tracking purposes is not preserved at replay time, the browser complains that it was forced to not go to the target link, but to the tracking link first, but the tracking link is not preserved. So that's a 404. Here is an example from a video asset as it is, this is a screenshot from the uh, sort of in a browser on the real live website. This is a screenshot from replay. So this is, fairly faithful, the video plays using an HTML5 uh, reader, the transcript uh, uh, follows along at the same time. Here's an example of a, an image resource live on the website versus as replayed from the lock system. Uh, and you can click on the download PDF button or you can enlarge the image and you will gain access to that resource that was embedded in the work. Here's a slightly more difficult one, this is a map. And as you can see, it has little uh, sort of zoom widgets and buttons, and it's really made of tiles. It's not really a single image. It is served dynamically by a triple IF service, service. And so in replay, it looks okay uh, until you try to zoom in and then it does not know the tiles. Uh, so it displays a gray box instead. If you zoom all the way in, then we have sort of found the smallest tiles and generated automatically by reverse engineering what the particular widget, the particular IIIF widget would like to do from these tiles. Uh, and, but uh, if the widget were to change or if it decided to do arbitrary subsections of the image, we would not have those. Uh, this is a screenshot of the uh, page turning uh, widget. Uh, and obviously uh, we did not uh, actually preserve this. We're preserving the PDF and we're preserving the EPUB as bundles of bytes, but we did not uh, have enough time to work on sort of re-rendering the arbitrary EPUB widget and the page turning widget. So in replay, the, the work is being preserved. If it were to trigger, we would have all the EPUB and all the PDF to at least give a somewhat comprehensive experience, but not an interactive experience. Uh, so just a quick conclusion before I uh, uh, give up the floor to my colleague Karen from Portico. Uh, so uh, there were some known lessons in here, certainly within the area of web preservation that we know about. Uh, combinatorial explosions of equivalent URLs are difficult to preserve. Dynamic font resources are difficult to preserve. Uh, the JavaScript hijacking of browser behavior makes it more difficult to replay uh, the preserved work. Uh, even if we have all the pieces of it and uh, these interactive rendering environments are difficult. But in this particular instance, we also were faced with the realities of sort of new lessons learned. Uh, so uh, even images are not uh, static anymore. And so it is difficult to obtain them and then replay them in the interactive way that is now more common in sort of enhanced environments. Uh, and the fact that external uh, resources are present in EPUBs is uh, making it much more difficult to preserve because it can be arbitrary places on the web. And I know that uh, Karen has much more to say about uh, this sort of embedded EPUB resources topic. Um, thank you for your attention. And uh, it's now a turn for the Karen's turn for a Portico.
Uh, thank you. So I shall uh, attempt to hijack the screen. Um, hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, so I'm Karen Hansen. I'm the senior research developer at Portico, and I'm just going to be telling you about what we did with some of the examples you saw from Fulcrum and Open Square. And uh, just to, to mention, this is the first phase of the project. So some of the more advanced um, works that were shown for Fulcrum, we, we didn't get to yet. So that's still to come. So um, I just want to mention a couple of things about Portico's perspective. So when we're talking about scalability of a solution, when a, when a publisher participates with Portico, we spend some time with them configuring a workflow uh, for their specific content. So that could take you know, days to weeks, depending on the complexity and what the goals are. So when we're talking about scalability, it's, it's in that form um, in, in the context of Portico. And in terms of access, so if a publisher can no longer give access to a resource for whatever reason, we might initiate a trigger event, in which case it will become accessible on our platform. And, and sometimes that has to happen quite quickly. So we don't expect our users to be um, file format experts or anything like that. So we want to present it in a, a usable form that they can, they can see all of the uh, intellectual content. Um, and a couple of notes, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan already touched on some of these, but uh, essentially an EPUB is like a zip file in, a zip file with a website in it, basically encapsulated. Um, it expresses the content as XHTML, which opens up the possibility for transforms. Um, and as of version three, it supports remote multimedia. And um, just to mention that we received, uh, we didn't do the web harvesting approach. We received all of these items as packages containing EPUBs. So, so that's what you'll see here. And the specific issue we focused on in the first section of this project was um, these remote resources. And what I mean by that is where visually it's embedded in the EPUB, but uh, the file itself actually lives outside of the EPUB or the URL. Um, and when I first started to research this, what I thought I would see is that just the file was outside of the EPUB. Um, and then it would be a matter of the choice of do we you know, create a persistent link for that and update the link internally in the EPUB or do we move the resource inside the EPUB? Um, however, um, as you, you might have picked up on from the examples, uh, the, we came across a few challenges with this assumption. So the first one with, was with Fulcrum's platform. Uh, and Jeremy showed you some examples where they have these iframes embedded in the work, um, not just referencing an external file, but actually a nice custom viewer. Um, and you can actually, that's just a view into another web page, and you can, you can even pop that out in a browser and you'll, you'll see the features there. Um, and when they gave us the package for the EPUB, uh, what was in it was the EPUB um, with those iframe references inside. Um, so we didn't have the media viewers. Uh, we had a list of, we had all of the multi, uh, multimedia files as separate from the EPUB. And then we had a really comprehensive metadata file that essentially gave us instructions to map the iframe paths to those media files. Um, so if we would leave this as is, um, when we triggered the content, it would look like this, assuming that the Fulcrum URL was no longer available. Um, and, and so there was, there's nothing here to sort of indicate how, how to get to that thing. And actually, the, the link um, to the resources inside the iframe as well, if you want to get to that landing page. Um, and the, the books varied, but in some cases that was, that was uh, true. Um, so leaving it as is would basically be um, asking the user to assemble this, um, and, and that would require some knowledge of the EPUBs and, and some sort of flicking between tabs and things. So we wanted to see if we could do a better user experience with this and preserve some of that, some of that experience. Uh, so, so um, so we wanted to see what it would take, um, given the instructions that that Fulcrum has packaged for us, um, what would it actually take to make that whole again? And what would be lost in the process compared to the original? Um, so the first thing uh, we would have to do is take out those iframes and replace them with generic HTML players. Um, and the instructions are there to do this. I was able to do it with XML transforms. Um, but so, but you would lose the, the quality of the Fulcrum player. Um, we were able to maintain the subtitles since that's uh, the video tag um, for HTML5 actually supports that. Uh, then for the audio player, um, again, using generic HTML5 tags, uh, we lose this nice scrolling transcript feature, um, but uh, I, I put that in the text area instead, um, basically because the audio, the generic audio tag doesn't support a transcript. Uh, and then for the images, I removed the iframes uh, that 
were displaying these nice image viewers and instead just embedded the image directly. So the second step we might do, and I think this is kind of optional because you could do it, you could do it two ways, but um, to get a nice self-contained package so the EPUB is whole um, and portable, we might uh, move a, a, a lower resolution copy of the file inside the EPUB, and that would be a simple um, case of uh, redoing, re rearranging the package and pointing the links inside. Um, you could, of course, leave them out outside and uh, generate persistent links with using something like arc IDs that can point right to the file. Um, but this is this is what this is another way of doing it. Um, and third, where there isn't a, a caption already, you would want to maybe include some of that metadata under those embedded features and then include a link, a persistent link to um, the landing page for the new location for the resource. So you can imagine if this was already here, it would just be a matter of repointing the link to the new location. Um, so, so what you get is um, a, an EPUB package and there's some pros and cons of doing the, the, the result. So on the plus side, you get a usable self-contained EPUB. You're no longer depending on specific web pages to be there. Uh, and it, you have all of the core intellectual content um, in a single package. And uh, because you have these external links to landing pages, those landing pages could evolve over time and, and maybe introduce some of those things that were lost. So we might have a, a nicer image viewer, for example. Um, on the downside, you end up with an EPUB that's much bigger than the original. Um, and if there's a lot of media, that could be problematic. Um, and you lose all of those nice Fulcrum experience uh, pieces to do with the, the media players. So the other challenge we saw was with OpenSquare, and Jonathan mentioned this, but um, some uh, by any media met necessary has these YouTube videos embedded. Um, so of course, you can imagine over time that um, this might happen where uh, the video could just disappear um, without warning. Um, and in this instance, the publisher was not able to get permission to copy this video and, and preserve it with the package. So um, Portico's policy is that we will only preserve what the, the publisher gives us or what we have direct permission to preserve. We're not, we don't sort of go out to URLs and try to capture content. So I was trying to think of a workaround for this. And one thing I came up with that might be able to do, we might be able to do in an automated way was to go through the EPUBs and identify um, anywhere that there's an iframe with a YouTube reference and then use the Internet Archive Safe Page Now service, which you can use as an API or manually. Um, and then it gives you back an archive link and that could be automatic, automatically appended under the video as a little note to link to the archive copy. <clears throat> so if you click on that link, then it points to the Wayback Machine um, and you can see a copy of the video there. Uh, so a couple of pros and cons. So now you have a means to get to the video if it's no longer available. Um, on the downside, if the video is still available, you're going to have this mysterious archive message that is interrupting the flow of the book. If the video is gone already, you're still going to have a gray box. Um, and you lose that convenience of having an embedded playable video. Um, and also, this needs to be done as early as possible. At, at the point of preservation, it might already be gone, and um, you might have missed the opportunity to capture it. Uh, I think ideally a, a publisher would try to secure the rights to take a copy of the video, which can be uh, difficult for trying to track down YouTube uh, users and whether it's their content and things like that. Um, but if you are able to get rights, there's this tool called YouTube DL, um, and I think it might be what the Internet Archive uses actually, um, but that will copy the video uh, and give you the file and the metadata um, so you could include it with the preservation package. And I think there's a really narrow set of use cases where Portico would do something like this because, because of our policies around getting permission. Um, but for individual cases that the publisher might be able to use this tool. Um, it, it is a command line tool, so you could integrate it into another, uh, another system or you could use it manually. <clears throat> so a couple of conclusions from this. Um, so I've shown you a number of ways that we can put together these, these packages for, so that they're, um, they're, they're easier to preserve and uh, easier to access. Uh, but each of these comes with risks. Um, first of all, each example involves actually visually modifying the EPUB, which is something we try to steer away from. We, we want the publisher to decide how their works should look. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that would be a decision we don't want to make. Uh, also, the process is likely very fragile. Um, just if, if you've worked with anything uh, 
like HTML, then you know a tag could appear that you weren't expecting, and all of a sudden it looks awful, and um, you know you would not be able to detect that very easy or easily or in an automated way. Uh, it's also a lot of extra configuration. Um, some of these took several weeks of, of work and, and uh, a number of transforms, so that could be very costly to configure. And finally, by the time we're taking preservation steps, those remote items might already be gone, so we might not even have the ability to capture them or know what they look like. Um, so all of this is to say, ideally, these kinds of steps would be upstream uh, on the publisher platform, um, where you know they could become part of the uh, part of the process of creating an export or part of the uh, preparation process for work. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so just to summarize, I wanted to generalize what, what I saw here. Um, I think uh, this is about EPUBs, but they could be thought about more broadly, I think. In general, it's easier for us to just replace a link um, than try to reconstruct what something should look like or reconstruct functionality. <clears throat> um, so it's good to make any, present, any important presentation code internal to a work. If resources have to live outside of the EPUB, it's good to use URLs that are easy to configure over time, preferably persistent identifiers. <clears throat> In the case of DOIs, we can actually point them at Portico if, if that's uh, where the access uh, copy, copy is. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little frog in my throat. Uh, and also, it's good to display useful captions under embedded features that might provide information to help find alternative paths to a resource if it doesn't work. And finally, um, it's good to assume that any third party, party features like a YouTube video are just inherently unreliable. So think about ways you might want to get the vital information from that in case it's gone in the future. Uh, so whether it's a description or still images <clears throat> uh, or things like that. And I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan and take a drink now. <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan, I think you're muted. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I just want to briefly go through some preliminary findings from that first sprint. I'll say just generally, um, the, the goals of the project are twofold. Uh, one is to develop processes at scale for preserving these new forms of scholarship. Um, and that is where uh, Portico and clocks really come into play. They're, they're you know, one of the parties that would presumably be doing this preservation. But the second goal is to uh, write recommendations and best practices for authors and publishers. So that just like Karen was saying, upstream, when publishers are considering publishing enhanced books or, um, or other kinds of um, new forms of, of scholarship, uh, they're aware and they're thinking already about the risks and the benefits involved, what technologies they're using, how they're doing it. And they have clear cut guidelines for, for doing that. Um, so we, in this project, after each sprint, we are going through a process of, um, of putting together all of, the, all of the findings from that sprint and discussing them with experts um, across the country in uh, digital, digital preservation, uh, legal experts, um, publishing experts. And here are some of the things that we kind of are, are thinking about after sprint one. Uh, publishers and authors um, should be thinking about the centrality of elements of the user experience to help determine what really needs to be preserved. And I think Fulcrum has done a lot of really great thinking about this. Um, there's always this tension in what we're doing between preserving uh, the user experience and preserving the work because in many cases, and especially many cases in later sprints, um, the user experience is actually a part of the work and drawing those boundaries can be quite, quite difficult. Um, but this is something that's really important for authors and publishers to think about from the start. Um, second, in cases where authors and publishers decide to include links to at-risk content, they should be aware of the risks and trade-offs. And this is something that we really plan to provide guidance with in our, in our best practices document. Um, so uh, 
one idea, and Karen kind of maybe referenced this, but um, when external media are included, um, it would be a great idea to have some way of making those links stable so that the, the location of the media can be moved, but the code, the links in the code do not have to be changed as they are moved into a preservation repository. And um, one, one idea that we were kind of turning over and discussing with many of the partners in this project was the possibility of, of embedding content into a large EPUB uh, for the sake of preservation. Now, this would not be an EPUB that would be, that would be easily used for exchange. You couldn't send it uh, easily over the web, but perhaps for the purposes of Clocks or Portico, um, the ability for publishers to create such an EPUB uh, you know, a valid EPUB according to standards would really aid in the, in the preservation process. So um, I'll just say before we go to Q&A that um, there, I think this project kind of deals at a, at a high level with tensions between digital preservation principles and uh, the business requirements of solutions at scale. Um, so there's often a temptation to do too much because we can say, well, here's a kind of technology, here's a solution that would work for everything. Um, and so we're tempted to use it across the board. Uh, and similarly, there's a temptation to do too little um, because it might, we might say, well, we can do this for every publication and that would scale, but it may not in fact honor the uh, the scholarly content that needs to be preserved and then accessed in the future. And so this project, I think, is about kind of exploring the range of new forms of scholarship in this field, uh, in, uh, in these digital monographs, and coming up with guidelines, perhaps, how to treat different features, how to, how to treat different types of technologies in this, in this landscape. Um, so with that, um, we are very, very happy to, to take some, some questions. Great, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, that was a really fascinating overview of the issues involved in preserving these enhanced monographs and the work that you all are doing to tackle some of these challenges. Um, so I wanna go ahead and open up the floor for questions. I'm sure there is a tremendous amount of interest in the work that you're doing and its implications. And we do have a question from Rob uh, Cardellano already. Hi, Rob. Um, looks like Rob has a two-part question here. Related to this last point, embedded content, embed content into a large EPUB for preservation. Number one, is EPUB 3.2 container format sufficient, sufficient for this purpose? And number two, does this also support usability over time in addition to preservation? For example, to be used with other readers such as Simply E and other Readium and non-Readium non EPUB reading engines. Um, I can take a stab at that. Um, so I, I think if you are going to do simple embeds in the form that I was talking about, then I think it is compatible. And um, actually the iframes were causing um, some validation problems uh, and, and also didn't play well in a number of readers that I tried them in where doing simple embeds um, worked much more reliably. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll say, I'll just add that I think that um, there's there's a lot more thinking to be done about that idea of a of a large you know a large hefty EPUB, um, but I think one of the challenges just is from the publisher side, which is to say that publishers are not used to creating such a thing, and it would be a special thing for mm -hmm. this purpose. So that's something to explore on their end. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in on that. Uh, I if I, if I have a second to also inject a, a thought, I would say that uh, my experience is that in general, small adjustments from publishing platforms to facilitate preservation can go a long way. And in my experience, publishers are reluctant to, uh, to engage in them because it is a special project and it, it is not with a big payoff. And so 
Uh, I think there is a, generally speaking, it, it needs to be more of a, of a directional awareness from say management than it is about the technology. We, we have workarounds, we have solutions, but sometimes it's difficult to convey that the preservation uh, aspect is just as important as other accessibility uh, aspects. If I could chime in as well, um, just thinking about our production process, you know, we're, we're producing one EPUB file that goes out to vendors like Barnes and Noble say uh, that uh, conforms to their their constraints on what they'll support in their their reading systems or what even they'll allow in their distribution channel. Uh, for instance, they don't tolerate videos being included in that in that EPUB file. And then when we upload them to uh, to Fulcrum, we have a process where we're optimizing them for the Fulcrum platform specifically for that presentation. But I think another process that is creating a third version of that EPUB for a third party preservation system makes a lot of sense just to be dropped into that pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this research, um, if it yields something like a specification for how different platforms or different production processes really, even before it gets to the platform, uh, could normalize that content for better preservation to get a something, something closer to the fulcrum preservation that's better than what Barnes and Noble is allowing, not to pick on them, um, I, I think that would be a great outcome. Also, I think it's not out of the question to keep the, the videos outside of the EPUB. It's, it's useful to have them inside because then you've got to preserve the link as well, which is extra complexity in the preservation process. Um, so that, that's, that's an option uh, too. Great, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, and Rob also just wanted to share with you that that was a great presentation. So thank you for that as well. We've got plenty of time for questions, so please feel free to uh, type them into the Q&A box. Or if you'd like to make um, a live comment or ask a live question, just raise your uh, virtual hand and uh, we can unmute you. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, let's see, Tib, you, you, I know you meant your comment to be um, a little <laughs> less uh, public, but I, nonetheless, I'm curious if you don't mind, I think you perhaps wanted to take up some of the risks and ideas in Karen's slides. What do you have you got some comments on those you want to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to if we have time and if there are no, no further questions from the audience, I, I think we should prioritize those. But I meant to, to join Karen on many of the points that she touched on in the risks and ideas categories, I think. We are very much in alignment, even though for this particular project, uh, uh, she invested a lot of work into the EPUB half, and I invested a lot of work into the HTML website portions, and yet the conclusions are quite similar, the, the ideas are quite similar, the obstacles are quite similar, and uh, those are that uh, transforming the EPUB upon ingest, if you think of it as a workflow, has many downsides and many dangers about it and many risks and it is difficult uh, I, I wanted to to concur that it is very difficult to detect uh, in a universal kind of way what all can have gone wrong and what all can be missing without combing through you know manually a lot of material to make sure that it does work and replay well and has all of the external materials sort of pulled into the preservation service so that it isn't at risk of being uh, out there and disappearing and not actually being right. And the appearances can be very deceiving in an EPUB or a website that the resource is really there when in fact it is replaying remotely right now, but will not necessarily be there for the long term. And so I, I was struck by how similar uh, our sort of conclusions are, even though we approach to this from uh, somewhat different angles. Interesting, yeah. Um, it w was interesting parallels. Karen, have you uh, got any comments on that? Um, yeah, I 100% I agree. Um, I think that something I noticed working with the Fulcrum uh, 
I, I worked with uh, maybe five, four or five different fulcrum books, and there were subtle differences. And um, I think Jonathan mentioned that there was a choice, uh, or it might have been Jeremy mentioned that someone had made a choice to just embed the image versus using the viewer. And those subtle choices can have impacts on what we can automate. And then all of a sudden, you're doing two different versions of the workflow, you know, that they branch out at that point. Um, and that sort of thing is easier to, to get at on the platform end. Um, where you're making the making changes in different directions and you just sort of incorporate that that switch there too. Um, so so that's why I say moving those kinds of things upstream is so much easier um, yeah. than trying to sort of do it on the on the ingest end. Indeed. Um, and it will be definitely interesting to see what kind of uh, best practices and um, recommendations come through from this uh, investigation. We, we have another um, question now. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Terrific work. I'm interested in the presenter's perception about the viability of solutions at scale. The presentation seems to be based on experience with about a dozen works, all of which seem to be unique and handcrafted. Is EPUB really a standard platform that lends itself to preservation at scale? or a slightly more constrained version of the Wild West of the internet that makes it highly resistant to preservation. I'm happy to take a stab at this question uh, and, and uh, other people should chime in also. So I think that this is a very astute observation, which is that EPUB is a bundle of arbitrary links to resources and files, kind of like web pages are. So it, it is in fact suffering from the same uh, or at least similar conceptual risks that arbitrary websites do. It is a little more constrained because it's not quite as programmable or arbitrary as, as a website or a web page, uh, uh, specifically to sort of like the locks methodology for things with a plugin. A plugin is meant to encapsulate the commonality of a particular publishing platform. So in this case, some amount of iterative work can yield to pretty high coverage of the features and functionalities of a particular website or publishing platform, meaning that that work is invested and then applied more broadly to the entire platform. And there's a diminishing rate of return over time on those sort of weird features and, and, and exceptions that aren't obvious in a sample of a dozen works or a half dozen works. Uh, so there, there's a big payoff here in having a platform that uh, even though it's customizable, eventually squeezes the content through a bunch of features that it has, and that's the finite set that it has. Uh, some of the works that we are working on for the later stages of this project are increasingly one-off, increasingly unique, uh, where uh, so a, a, an arbitrary web presentation of work or scholarly research has been made and that, then that work doesn't scale quite as well because there is now no payoff of having analyzed and circumvented all the widgets of a particular presentation and then moving on to the next work, which is yet completely different and was built from scratch using uh, different tools and, and resulting in a completely different visual and technological presentation. So I think that uh, EPUB is one way to funnel the diversity through a particular standard. But of course, you know, one could one could be cynical about it and say, oh, yes, well, that worked so well with HTML being a standard and JavaScript being a standard, right? So it, there's definitely some, some risks there. I, I'll, just, I'll just add on to that, that I think that it's important also to think about the kind of cultural um, norms and constraints uh, uh, as, as far as the, the publishing world go, goes. So yes, um, you can put you know, millions of things inside an EPUB and you could do crazy things that would be very, very hard to preserve. But in real life, we do see patterns in scholarly publishing. Uh, we see certain kinds of things, perhaps in certain fields, perhaps with certain publishers. And that's part of what we're trying to do is to give, um, to, to develop services and uh, guidelines to preserve not any EPUB at scale, uh, any set of EPUBs at scale, but EPUBs from this particular community of, of publishers and, and scholars. So I think that's, that's part of what we're doing is maybe drawing those, those boundaries and say, what are the most important features that we need to be able to handle? And what's out of bounds? What is scalable? How can we, how can we help this community um, preserve their work better? Great, thank you. And thank you for that. Terrific question. Um, 
on to the next question here, another question from Rob Cardellano, uh, who comments, it's so fascinating to have common findings from multiple approaches. Can't the EPUB open container format, quote, distribution in a single file container, potentially provide a solution to address usability and preservation? And he includes a, a URL here, which I will but shout out to everyone. I think those are the specifications, perhaps. There we go. Anybody like to comment on that? Sounds like it's maybe something for us to, to look into and, and think about. I mean, I, I am familiar with the, the open container format at a high level, but not, not well enough to, to comment on that. Right. I think that there's certainly something appealing about a sort of website in a box, having something you can have that self-contained, I guess in a way a, a web archive file has, has got similarities in that respect. Um, so I, th I think in terms of usability and not having to keep um, track of all of the external links that you need to support the work, then it is, it is a useful format. And, and if the fact that it's an open format and it's very, when you open it up, you can, if you know some you know, web languages, you can understand it quite easily. It's an it's a, it's a attractive format for preservation. I, think. I agree also that any attempt to say this will be a self-contained bundle and it will not have any external dependencies uh, is is good for preservation, obviously. Uh, of course, uh, in research, the PDF format is thought of it as being that way. At least if you get the PDF, it's a single thing. But even PDFs now are containers for arbitrary external things and have widgets to replay on the inside. So so there's limitations. But I think that this, uh, this is a promising format. Hmm. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Rob. Um, looks like some grist for the for the mill. All right, well, we've had some great questions um, and we still have a little bit of time for more questions. If there are any out there, please go ahead and share them with us as we're waiting. Um, a final thanks to our panel. Thank you so much for coming to talk to CNI about this project and just um, an opportunity to let you all weigh in one last time if you have more comments to add, please feel free to do so. Um, Diane, I have a, actually a question since I don't see anybody else jumping up and um, I'll do it by audio because it, it takes a little setup. So if you go back to the age of the print book, you certainly had citations in a printed book to other works and in preserving the work, you would never think of, you know, I have to preserve every other work that it's cited in order to preserve this work. Um, you also typically in the print world had a sort of a negotiating process where if you wanted illustrations, um, you'd look and you'd see, can I clear the rights for this picture that I might want to include? How much will it cost? Um, how critical is it? And you might have, have what essentially constitutes citations to paintings or something like that that you couldn't clear rights for and or didn't feel were absolutely critical. Now, when we go to digital works, something funny goes on because you have a tendency to want to use U URLs or uh, DOIs or some kind of actionable identifier because they're very convenient for the reader jumping from one work to another. Um, but I'm not at all clear that we have a language right now whereby authors and publishers can sort of signal that intent that these really are part of the work as we think of it and these are really cite external citations and they just are actionable largely for con the convenience of the reader. Um, do you see any signs or hear any thinking about how authors and and publishers may be able to signal those intentions as we get more serious about preserving um, uh, things like um, like ebooks. So, I'll, that is that's a great question. Um, we've, in some ways, what we've done with this project 
is kind of just drawn a line in the sand um, and said that those things that are links, which is to say it's a hyperlink in the text and it takes you to another page, um, is not in scope for, for our project. And that we're not, uh, if it's simply, you know, the, the assumption was if the scholar or the publisher simply made it a link without trying to embed it in some way so that the user or reader could experience it in the flow of the work, then it's not part of the work in the in the same way. Now, that we could absolutely examine re-examine that, and I think that there, there's some utility in thinking through those that assumption more in a more rigorous way. But that's kind of the line that we drew. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of these works. Uh, publishers have gone through a lot of trouble to present video and um, data visualizations and you know other kinds of data in the context in context within the work um, and the ones that we showed today were relatively straightforward but a lot of the works that we, we've been um, examining in the later sprints are quite complex and so what it means to be um, presented in the context of a work is something that would be very diff might be very difficult to um, to do in another way, and so it's very important to to maintain that flow and that those relationships. Um, does anyone else anyone else have any? I'd like to if I could follow up. Um, yeah, I think that's I think those are great points, and I think I mean, it's, it's a conversation we have um, over and over again with our authors because of our ability to host. Uh, digital resources with the book. Uh, many authors have a misconception that that means we should have their entire research archive hosted on the platform, which is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to do something that more directly supports the argument that they're trying to make or illustrates it, you know, serves like the equivalent function of a chart or a table that you'd put in a book, except this is a real time media object, right? And so we don't want, if your book is about, um, uh, a, a, a musician, we don't want their entire, uh, the archive of all of their output, right? Um, but the question of whether it's directly supporting the argument or not really comes down to an editorial choice. The editor has to tell me whether they think it's vital to, to the work or not, and whether it makes a difference if it's embedded in the flow of the text or whether there should be a hyperlink. So it, while you know those choices are constrained by your ability uh, to to support them technologically, they're not technological choices from from my point of view. They're editorial choices. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the definition of, of what um, should be contained in the work for us is given to us by the publisher in some way, and what is in the package. Um, but it's it's interesting to to think about um, the idea of how to express sort of compound work works and where the boundaries around those are. Um, more generally, um, I think is a, a, a challenge. Um, I mean, there's the OAI or RE work. Um, but yeah, what I found, so I, I worked on the sort of links between compound works and what we found is in some ways that uh, what's contained in a compound work is up to the, the scholar in, in the moment that they're creating them. So it's sort of, um, it's a little bit subjective. Thanks. That's really interesting, and it, it's it's helpful in situating where those choices are made and how they're signaled. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for that question, Cliff, and thanks everybody. Um, I want to thank you again for joining us at CNI and all of our attendees. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. Take care, all. Applause. Great panel. Thank you.